Jesus. Well, has the Lord been good to you? I want to I wanna have it's like about a 10 to 12 minute video of a pastor. He's not a prophet, he's a pastor. Uh, but how many of you know God can use you in any way, form, or fashion he wants to if you're willing to yield to him? Uh, but this was given last Sunday's message, and Brother Mike showed it to me, I believe, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and he said, Call me back, Pastor. He says, Hey, he said, Actually, I'll call you in a couple hours. He says, I want you to listen to this and tell me what you thought about it. Well, I'll be honest with you. I mean, as soon as I turned that thing on, I mean, how many of you ever been drawn by the Holy Ghost? I mean, I'm telling you, when you hear this thing, get ready. Get your shouting shoes on. Because I'm telling you, this is something to shout about. Uh, we know that God speaks through the prophets. And if you've been paying attention to the real, true prophets of God, uh, you know, they've been speaking some things. And you say, well, Pastor, what's the difference between the prophets and what we have? Well, the prophets of God see the things, and we know them in here. That's the difference. But how many of you know this? Same Holy Ghost. Everybody say, same Holy Ghost. I mean, everything that, you know, any person gets up and says by the Spirit of God, you should, it should be bearing witness in here with you. It's just God bears it witness in here. We know it, but the prophets see it supernaturally. So either way, it's still the same message. Glory to God. So this is going to, so, I mean, man, by all means, I, I may start shouting again up here. So, it, I mean, this, this is good. Now, the guy's name, I, don't, I know it's kind of funny, and he gives a little dry humor here at the beginning. Uh, you know, he says, I don't know why God always speaks to me at the end of the year. He said, close to Christmas. Well, his last name is Christmas. Uh, and so I thought, well, I mean, what do you think? Why do you think he speaks to you the last year? Your name is Christmas. So, but anyhow, listen to this. This is a word in due season for the people of God. And so get ready. Turn it on if you would, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are you ready? I was texting Don here this morning. Well, I texted him yesterday, and I said, hey, I want to watch this. I don't know if I can do that. Well, he called me this morning. I got it. I said, let's get ready to rumble. Come on, church. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, glory to God. Well, come on, everybody stand up. Stand up praise him. Come on, act like you believe it. Thus saith the word. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord God. We are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath. Rejoice. And again I say rejoice. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, you got something to shout about today. Is he good? You know, the Bible, I was reminded when he was talking, you can be seated. I was reminded of the scripture in the Old Testament talks about when the enemy comes in, God raises a standard up. And how many of you know that no matter what the enemy does, God sees it, he hears it. But once again, he's got to, his people have got to come to that place where they're ready to receive and ready to move. Everybody say, I'm ready to receive, and I receive the word of the Lord, and I'm ready to move. Glory to God. Well, open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Judges. Get into the Word so the Word can get into us. Shine lights into our lives so we can become more like Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. How many of you know the church is the powerhouse to this earth? Come on, think about that now. The church is not some weak entity. No, this is the body of Christ. It's the powerhouse, the representative of the kingdom of God, to this earth. Hallelujah. Notice if you would go to Judges, please. We've been talking about Gideon. Gideon, a man by the name of Gideon. And why are we looking at Gideon? Well, the Lord told me, he said, the reason I want you to preach and teach on Gideon is because 
That's what I'm going to do in these last days. I'm going to raise up people that don't think highly of themselves. They think they're nobody, that they can't do anything. They think, you know, I'm just low on the pole. Nobody pays attention. He said, but I'm raising up people that will obey me out of nowhere. And see, that's what God wants to do. We're looking at an example in the Bible of a man. Go back to Judges, if you would, please, chapter 6. And I want to remind you about how Gideon thought about himself. And if you degrade yourself, belittle yourself below the Word of God, then you'll never reach the potential of what God has for you. You have to go and look in the Word of God and see what God says about you and believe what God says about you over society and even people in your family. They may look at you and your family like, oh, you'll never mount anything, you'll never do anything. But once again, if we go to the Word of God, which is the truth. Everybody say, God's Word is the truth. If we go to God's Word and He tells us we can do great exploits for Him, then we have to believe God over what people say to us. But notice what Gideon said here in Judges chapter 6 about himself. Now, God's already called him. God's already gave him a commission. God's already told him to go, and what does he do? You know, when God gives you a commission tells you what you're supposed to do. How many of you know you're supposed to move out? But what did he do? He just stood there. Why? He didn't have confidence or believe in what God said to him. Verse 14, Judges chapter 6, verse 14. And the Lord looked upon him, looked on Gideon, and said, Go in this thy might, that thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. The Midianites were terrorizing them. They were stealing from them. They were impoverishing them. They did get into sin. They brought it on. But God, the the Christ came from, from the earth to God. God heard them. He's bringing a deliverer. We know, once again, we go back in the beginning, verse 7 and verse 8, God sent a prophet. Everybody say, God sent a prophet. He sent a prophet, and the prophet gave the word to them. Now he's going to raise up somebody to deliver them because God uses people for His divine purposes. Say that with me. God uses people, point yourself, and people just like me for His divine purpose. He is bound to humanity. That He has nobody else to do it but you and I. Now He goes on to tell him, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel, From the hand of the Midianites, notice what he said. He said, go. Everybody say, go. And how many of you know Jesus told the church a long time ago in Mark chapter 16, go. Don't ever come to the place in your Christianity where you're just settled into the place where you're not going to move out and go forward and do the things of God. So he told him, he commissioned him to go in his might, get up, time to move forward, go and get the victory. And notice what he said in verse 14. Have not I sent thee? In other words, didn't I tell you to go? Has Jesus, the head of the church, told the church in one of his last commissions on earth, did he not commission us to go into the highways and the byways? We have been told to go. Notice he didn't move out. Why? Verse 6, verse 15. And he said unto him, O my Lord, Wherewith shall I save? In other words, oh my Lord, how am I going to save Israel? In other words, he doesn't believe what God just told him. You and I are confronted with things in the Word of God that tells us things about us that we look and we go, Lord, I don't know who you're talking about, but you're not talking about me. What have we done? We've told, taken sides, taken opposition to what God said. And he said, oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? In other words, he's asking the question. He doesn't believe it. That's what happens. Questions arise when you doubt God. Write that down. Questions arise when you doubt God. Write it down. That's why that's a symptom or a sign of unbelief. Questions. Well, what about this? What about that? 
We want all the answers before we move. And God doesn't give us all of the answers. He tells us to get up and move because He wants us to walk by faith, not by sight. Hello, church. That has been His commission all along. And so here's what He begins to tell God. He questions Him and He said, Behold, my family is poor. In Manasseh, in other words, of the tribe of the people of Manasseh, my family's poor. Everybody say, I'm poor. Does that matter to God? Look at your name and go, that means nothing to God. Now, how many of you know God doesn't want you to be poor? But listen, don't think because you're poor, you can't be used by God. He said, behold, my family is poor. And if that isn't bad enough, he goes on to say, And I am the least in my father's house. In other words, I'm the low man on the pole. You're going to use me to deliver the nation of Israel from our enemies? God, do you realize? How many of you know God realized that? And how many of you know, listen, listen, he's not the first person that did this. Moses, when he was in the wilderness, the burning bush, God, I can't do that. I mean, I can't speak. How many of you remember that? We've got all these excuses why we can't do it. Now, we have this thing, it's a teaching going on. A lot of people say it, and we have to be careful, and I address it quite a bit because it still keeps coming on. It sounds religious, it sounds biblical, but it's demonic. And the, the subject is, you know, all things work together, you know, everything just works out fine. God's got a plan. If you don't know, how many of you know God gave us this Bible so we can know the plan of God? And so say this with me I can know. The plan of God, the will of God, if I'll read the Word of God. So notice, he begins to tell him some things. He said, I, I'm the least. I can't do anything. Once again, it's not by your might. It's not by your intelligence. It's not by your money. Come on, church. It's not by your gifts and talents. It's by the Spirit of God. What did we just hear up there? It's not going to be by government. Huh? Why is that? Because, listen, when man does it, man takes the credit. But when God does it, God has to get the credit. So what is he looking for? Once again, man, God has bound himself to man to perform his divine purposes. He needs somebody on the earth that won't question won't debate, won't argue, but will just flat out say, okay, God, you say it, I'll do it. So let's all practice it. Okay, God, you say it, I'll do it. And then how many of you know we just go and be obedient to him? So now let's go back here. We know, go to Judges chapter 8. We're coming back. So now through many visitations, some angelic, some God personally speaking to Gideon. Gideon becomes a man of faith, which, by the way, that's how God wants every person, every child of God on earth to live by faith. Hello, church. You, you, you see, you just took that like, oh, yeah. No, listen. If you're not living by faith, you can't be pleasing to God. Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to what church? To please Him. Go to Romans, keep your finger there in Judges, and go to Romans chapter 1. We know this, we quote it, we hear it, and it just kind of, kind of rolls off of us, and it really doesn't stick. It just hasn't got to the place where it needs to be, this is how God really wants me to live. And, and this is why Christians are struggling, because they're not using their faith. They're not walking by faith. And for a lot of Christians in America, it's not because we haven't heard the Word. It's because we haven't made a decision to believe the Word over our circumstance. We haven't made a decision to live by it. And if I'm not going to live by it, then I'm not living by faith. And if I'm not living by faith, can I please God? Huh? 
Come on now. If I'm not living by faith, can I please God? Let's go to Romans, the first chapter. Romans chapter 1. No, this is so critical. These things we've heard for years. I preached them. I've taught them. Other, pre- other preachers preached them, taught them. People hear them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet you never see the transition from the flesh to faith. Or we could say you never see the transition from flesh to the Spirit. Now remember, if I'm walking in the flesh, I'm going to perform the duties of the flesh. And Romans chapter 8 says that they are contrary to the will of God. Why? Because the flesh is the enemy's playground. Faith in the Spirit is God's playground. God wants His kids, His sons and daughters, to be on His turf. Notice in Romans, the first chapter, if you would please, go to verse 16 and verse 17. And this is how you and I are to live. Live, not just for some things, but live every day. Get up, go to church, go home by faith. Sit in your house in safety by faith. Get up in the morning if you're going to work. Go to work by faith because of protection. While you're at work, God's protection by faith. While you're there at work, have the favor of God by faith. While you're there at work, you need a witty invention of the wisdom of God by faith. While you come home or you have your meal there, what are you going to do? You're going to pray over your food and bless it by faith. You come home by faith for protection. Can you see how God wants us to live by faith? Everybody say live by faith. Notice in verse 16, Romans 1, 16. The Holy Ghost through Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ashamed of the word of God? Or are you excited about the word? Man, it's a good time to get excited, isn't it? He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Everybody say, The gospel message is the power of God. Say it again. The gospel message is the power of God. Everybody got a Bible? Raise it up. Say this with me. This Bible, the gospel message, God's Word is the power of God. Now notice what it says, what it will lead us to, because this is the first step. It will lead us what? It is the power of God unto salvation. Everybody say unto salvation. Why? That's the first thing everybody wants is to experience the power of God of being born again, the new creation. Notice he said to everyone that what church? Believeth, are you verse 16? It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that what church believeth. Do you have to believe it? Do you have to believe it? What activates or what causes your salvation to happen? Because you believe it. Everybody say, Because I believe it. Now, think about this that's the greatest gift. The Bible says salvation is a gift. Jesus was a gift to mankind. What he did for the Father, for you and I, was a gift from God. But not everybody receives the gift. Not everybody believes the gift. Jude says in the last days, we're in the last days, by the way. If you haven't figured that out, I'll just tell you we're in the last days. Jude says in the last days that scoffers and mockers will come. They're here. They're making fun. But how many of you know God will have the last word? Hallelujah. So notice, he said, the one that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now you say, well, pastor, I'm not a Greek. Well, the word Greek just simply means to the rest of the world. So it was to the Jews first, to the, also to the Greeks and to the world. Verse 17. How am I to live? How does he want me to live? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith. Everybody say from faith to faith. Everybody say faith to faith. How many of you have served the Lord for at least or been born again for at least 20 years? Raise your hand. How many of you can say that there are things that you have learned in your early years of Christianity that since then you have grown and grown and grown. And what do I mean by that? I mean you have gone from a faith where you started in that and now you've gone from faith to faith. 
Why? My faith can grow. Everybody say, my faith can grow. It's not just a matter of having faith, but I want to go from faith to faith. Everybody say, faith to faith. Look at me. You want to go from faith to faith. We want to have that increasing faith, don't we? He said, God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. Everybody say, it is written. Notice verse 17. Are you at verse 17? Notice what he said. The just. Who is the just? The just are those who have accepted salvation. The just are those who are walking in the righteousness of God. The just are the Christians. The just are the people that ask Jesus in their life. The word just means they have been justified. How have we been justified? Not by our own works. We've been justified because we accepted the plan and the purposes that God did through His Son Jesus and allowed us to get saved. We accepted them, and now in the eyes of God, in the mind of God, and in the heart of God, we have been justified and accepted by the Father because of Jesus, but it happened because we believed it. Or we used our belief or our faith system. And it said, the just, everybody say, that's me, or the righteous, the just shall live by what church? Everybody say, I am to live by faith. Now notice, this is what God said to the church. He wants every believer to live, live, live by what? Faith. This didn't come, now, unfortunately I have to say this, but sometimes we have people, when you tell them about faith, they go, oh, you're of that camp. Oh, oh you're that faith camp thing. Oh, 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 you're those fanaticals. Oh, yeah, you talk in tongue. I, I plead guilty. Uh, by the way, I preach prosperity. I plead guilty. By the way, I speak in tongues. You want to hear me? Glory to God. And, and now listen, listen carefully now. We have to be careful saying we're from this camp or from that camp when the camp of God is a faith camp. What did we just read, church? This came from God. Through the Holy Ghost, through his servant Paul, and Paul got inspired by the Spirit of God, wrote it on paper and said, by the way, tell my people I want them to live by faith. So when somebody says, you believe that faith stuff? Say, you can't get saved without it. We just read it in verse 16. Now listen, if we get salvation by faith, how do you think we get everything else from God? Because he told us, he already told us how we're going to get things from God. He told us, if I'm going to get things from him, I've got to go through the avenue of faith because that's how he wants me to live. What does that mean? I'm going to have to choose what he said over my circumstances. I'm going to have to choose what he said. See, it's your choice. Every person in this earth, in this room, out in that parking lot, wherever you're at, it's your choice. God will not force you to choose. God will love you if you choose not to live by faith. He just can't do for you what He wants to do because you did not choose to go the route He said, come over to my playground. So the next time you hear somebody talk about a faith preacher, a faith person, say, I plead guilty. God tell, told us to live that way. Now, go back to Judges. Judges. So he's a faith man. Go back and look. Hebrews chapter 11. We call that the Hall of Faith chapter. And what is it? Gideon is in there. Why? He came from feelings. He came from emotions. He came from, you know, how he looked at himself, how he belittled himself. He was using all kinds of excuses, and God kept with him. And how many of you know you're going to go from faith to faith? You're going to grab a hold of a little bit. You're going to apply it. And then as you continue to apply the Word and do the Word of God, God's going to give you more revelation. Everybody say more revelation. And when you get more revelation, what am I going to do? I'm going to go from the faith here. Now I'm going to grow a little bit more in my faith. And what am I doing? I'm going from faith to faith. Everybody say, I'm going from faith to faith. 
And so notice what's going here now. Now he tells them what to do, how to get the victory. Go to Judges chapter 7. And so we began looking two weeks ago about the sword of the Lord and Gideon. We found in verse 18 and verse 20, Gideon, no doubt God told him, this is how you're going to get the victory. This is what I want you to do. Everybody say, this is what I want you to do. And so notice he said in verse 18, he told him, he said, guys, I got 300 men. How many of you remember the story we looked at several months ago? God, there was thousands of men that showed up. God said, there's too many. Everybody say, too many. And he told them, and God said, why there's too many? He said, because they'll take the credit. I did it. Look what I did. Look at me. I remember Brother Hagin, one of the visitations that Jesus uh, came to him about, he said, there are three things I want to warn you about never to touch. And one of the three things he said was never touch the glory. Now, what does that mean? What he was telling him was never take the credit for anything. If Listen, if I'm preaching the Word of God by the anointing of God and six people get saved, four people get healed, two people get delivered, you get the idea? You have to be careful saying, yeah, yeah, I got him saved. No, listen, I'm not the deliverer, I'm the messenger. That would be like the guy delivering the newspaper, taking all the credit for the good in the news. We're just the delivery boy. Come on, church. But now, how many of you know, we've got to give it out to the people, right? And how many of you know this? God wants you to do something, right? So he said, he was telling him, he said in verse 18, when I blow with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of the hill, and say the sword of the Lord and the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And we talked about God and working with God and God working with us. Verse 19, so Gideon and the hundred men that came with him, they broke up into three divisions, and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp, talking about the camp of the Midianites, in the beginning of the middle watch was somewhere around 10 p.m. And they had newly set watches. In other words, they put new post guards there around 10 o'clock. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the, held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands. Notice they're not holding swords. Have you thought about that? They're not holding swords. How are you going to defeat an enemy with no sword? How many of you know Ecclesiastes says there's a time and a season for everything? It's coming, but not right now. This is not how we're going to start the battle, guys. I'm going to kind of get the thing going, God's saying. I'm going to take care of a bunch of them right off the bat. I'm going to put, I'm going to listen. If you remember what we heard the Spirit of God said through the through the servant, that the things the enemy has imposed to the church, he is going to turn them around, and now it's going to be on them. Huh? How many of you know God loves to turn the captivity? The Bible says in the Old Testament, the captivity of Zion. Zion in the Old Testament is a type of the New Testament church. Why? God loves to turn around what the enemy used and turn it around to them. Church, he's going to do it. And this is a picture of him doing it. Now listen, what's God going to do? Instead of the Midianites imposing fear on the Israelites, God is going to take something very simple and impose fear on them. Everybody say this with me. Turnabout is fair play. By the way, that's a sermon I preached over in, the old, over in the old sanctuary. But notice in verse 19, in verse 20, and it said, So once again, their left hands and the trumpets in their right hand to blow with all, and they cried and said, The sword of the Lord end up Gideon. So what happened? They broke these pots. They raised their torches in one hand, the lamps in the other. So notice what's going on here now in verse 21. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran 
and cried and fled. Can you see now fear is in the enemy's camp? Can you see that? What are they doing? They're breaking rank and order. Now they're running in stark fear and terror. Just what they did to Israel. Let's read on. Everybody say it with me. Thank you, Lord. You are a delivering God. And so notice in verse 22. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. In other words, what happened was the enemy started killing one another. That's a good way to start a battle. We just left the Lord. Hey, I'll break some pots, raise my lamp, glory to God, blow the trumpet, get some stark terror in them, turn it around on them, put back the fear on them, and what do they do? Now they're starting to kill one another. Everybody say confusion. And that's what's going on in the camp. How many of you know confusion is not from God, but the enemy, he'll bring it. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled. To, I'm not even going to try to pronounce some of these names. But notice they were fleeing, they were leaving, and to the border of Abelaveth and Tabith. Verse 23, and the men of Israel gathered themselves out of Nathal and out of Asher. And these are, these are all names of one, the 12 tribes. Now notice, and pursued after the Midianites. Now up to this point, they were, they were never pursuing them. But how many of you know when you got the enemy on the run, what do you do? Keep running him out of Dodge. Don't just have him turn his back. Get him out. Get him away. And so they're pursuing. They're going after the enemy. Verse 24, this is a physical enemy. Our weapons, our enemies are spiritual many times. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters. He's talking about Beth Bar and Jordan. In other words, I need some of you guys from this other camp that are not part of the 300. Send some messengers out. The enemy's going down by the River Jordan. We got to cut them off at the pass. Some of them are going this way. Some of them are going that way. You have to read the whole story, and we have to stop them from getting away. So what did he do? Remember, God First of all, got it down to 300 people, didn't he? God said, God picked, he's good, he's not good, he's good. No, he's not good, he's not good, he's not good. Yep, he's good. Got it down to 300 plus getting 301 people. God said that. Now, there's, now the enemy's splitting and dividing, so Gideon asks for help. He calls on other people that are not part of the 300. And notice what happens. He's calling on these other people, these other tribes, asking them, hey, we've got the Midianites on the run. Some of them split, though. Some of them's going down by the Jordan River. We need your help. Go down after some of them. We're going to go after this group. What's happening? And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Ephraim. And he said, come down against the Midianites. Come and help us. And he said, uh, tell the men of Ephraim, gather themselves together and take the waters or go by the waters. And he talks about Beth Barar and Jordan. And notice what happened. They went down. They pursued. They followed. They went down to the waters. Not Gideon's men. These men from Ephraim. And verse 25. And they took two princes of the Midianites. In other words, in their, they were escaping down by the Jordan. What happened was the other tribe went after them, and they got two princes. Everybody say two princes. Now, what are princes? Princes are not kings, but they're high-ranking officials. They got some clout. They got some pool. And so they catch them, not Gideon, not Gideon's men, but these men do. And how many of you know, whatever Gideon does, 
for God, and whatever God does through Gideon, everybody benefits. Say this with me. The road to victory is not always easy. And I mean, you know this, if you're going to walk on this road with God, you're going to have opposition. You're going to have people to deal with. You're going to have sometimes people that are going to oppose you are going to be within your own camp. People that are not going to understand you. I don't understand that faith stuff. <laughs> Just making a decision, I believe the Word, over the circumstance. I'm not saying the circumstances aren't real, but I believe God's Word is more real and more trustworthy than the circumstance. Remember now, when you and I got saved, we came out of a world. Here's the world's process. The world's process is that there are a lot of good things, and a lot of things can happen, but not all things can happen for you. Now we come into the kingdom of God. Everybody say the kingdom of God. Now we come into the kingdom of God, but once again, we come from walking by sight. Now we're going to walk by faith, and we're going to walk by what God says in the Spirit. And now we come over into God's kingdom where everything is possible. Hello, church. Say it with me. Everything is possible in the kingdom of God. Now, after all, isn't that what Jesus taught? Write the scripture reference. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. What did Jesus say? Talking to a parent, bringing somebody there. The parent took the, the, the demon-possessed child to the disciples. The disciples, they couldn't cast him out. And notice Jesus is looking for faith because God loves faith. Everybody say, God loves faith. And by the way, he loves it when you choose his word over the circumstance and situation, no matter what it is, no matter if it's a spiritual thing, a soulish mental thing, or a physical thing. God has a word in due season for every situation where you can use the word of God that it is greater. And if you'll believe God and walk by faith, listen, God's word will oppose that situation where God's word will set you free if you'll believe it. But you have to walk by faith, first of all. You have to walk by faith. Everybody say, you got to walk by faith. I mean, when Peter got out of the boat, Peter actually had to walk a piece to get to Jesus. He didn't just automatically get out of the boat and he was with Jesus. He had to walk by faith. Everybody say, had to walk by faith. Sometimes you're going to have to walk by faith before things happen. Unfortunately, most Christians, we want something to happen and then go, oh, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. No, you didn't. We could see the fear on your face. We could hear the, you know, the quivering in your voice, your knees knocking. We could see the intimidation. No, listen, you've got to say what God says and walk by faith so it can happen to you. Everybody say amen. So here's what's happening to him. Notice verse 25. And so, this other group, still Israelites, from another tribe, they split off, they help Gideon, and they catch two princes. Quite a catch, isn't it? We got the enemy. Now, we're going to look at something a little grotesque. And you have to understand something. In those days, when you took a leadership and you... You slew or slayed or killed the leadership. Many times today, today we do something different, not with men, but with animals. When we kill what we call a trophy, we get it mounted. We put it on our coffee table. We put it on the wall, whether it be a fish, a deer, whatever. We, we put the head of it up. What they would do Many times in those days when they killed an oppressing leader, they would cut their heads off. And listen, I don't want to sound too grotesque, but you just got to understand. That head was their trophy. That head was like the enemy is dead. So see, how many remember some of the, the old mafia movies where they would say, ah, uh, well, how do, you, how do you know he's dead? Are you sure you killed him? Yeah, I sure you. Are you sure you killed him? Because if you didn't kill him, he's coming after me. How many remember movies like that in the mafia? Well, how do you know he's dead? And they got this little bowling ball bag. 
Are you sure he's dead? Look in the bag. Oh, oh, yeah, he's dead. Why? Because the enemy's head was in the bag. Now, let's read on. I'm giving you a heads up to let you know. So you're not going, well, Pastor, I wish you wouldn't have said that to me. No, listen, that's what they did. By the way, how many remember David and Goliath? David was not king. David was around 17 years old when he fought Goliath. He was not in any leadership. He was a shepherd. His brothers told him, why don't you just shut up, go home, don't bother us. You gave us our meal from Dad. Get on out of here. But David was intrigued. But how many of you remember when David, when David went up and Goliath was dead, not because of the sword, but because of the stone that hit him in the head, what did David do? David, and we just heard it, David took Goliath's sword, his own weapon that he killed other people and terrorized people with, and cut off Goliath's head. And if you go back and read the story, go back in 1 Samuel chapter 15, guess what David did? He reached and got a hold of Goliath's head, and he lifted it up. It was his trophy. You have to understand how they dealt with things. Now, we don't do that today in the church with our enemies. I know some of you would like to have done some of those things. Yes, there have been many a times, like Brother Nick would say, God, turn your head for just five seconds. That's all I need, just five seconds. I will take care of it myself. No, now we come to the New Testament. The New Testament, we are to, I hate to say this, but Jesus said it. We're to love our, everybody say love your enemies. How many of you know that's best? Why? We want them to get to heaven. All right, now, let's read verse 25. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Orib, that's the one prince's name, Orib and Zeb. And they slew Orib upon the rock. In other words, they probably laid him down, put his neck, stretched his neck out across like the old turkeys did with the hatchet, and off with his head. And Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads. So what were they doing to prove that they got these two princes? What did they bring, church? Hey, look at our trophies we got, guys. Now, I know it's kind of squeamish for some people, but once again, this is just how they did things. We got proof. How do we know you killed them? Here they are. We've got two heads. Hallelujah. They're dead. And they brought him to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. They were on one side. Gideon was on the other side. Verse 8, now here comes trouble. You think they'd be excited. Hey, guess what, man? We didn't start this battle. We weren't in this battle in the beginning. But guess what? We got in on this battle, and we got two princes, man. We got two heads to prove it. Let's read on. Now Gideon becomes a diplomat practicing diplomacy. Now, what is diplomacy? Well, we hear that term all the time, particularly when we, have, we send somebody from our country to another country and they talk about diplomacy. What is diplomacy? Diplomacy is a person is going over trying to find a peaceful remedy without war or without causing trouble. Diplomacy. How many of you know you have to practice diplomacy dealing with people? Sometimes you've got to do it in your own marriage, don't you? My wife, she asked me these questions. I've been married to her for 34 years. And she asked me these questions. I go, why do you ask me those questions? I said, because if I asked you this way, because, see, I've been married for 34 years. Now, I couldn't say this for six months. When you've been married for somebody 34 years, I, I know, but Brittany, when you get married, you just need, don't ask your husband the 22 questions. What's the 22 questions? They're loaded. Because I know, and Jerry knows what I'm talking about. Uh, every husband and wife have been married very long. You know what I'm talking about. If your wife asked you this question, like, for instance, my wife, just about every Sunday morning, she asked me this question. And I, I'm just, on the inside, I'm going, oh, why do you ask me? She's going to ask me the question that's so endearing to women. 
How do I look? And listen, if I don't say enough, you didn't look long enough. Put your hand down. We're all in the same camp. And listen, if I say too much, then she goes, oh, you're being ridiculous. Stop that. And so I'm like, uh, it looks great. And she goes, you didn't even look at my shoes. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I, I apologize. I didn't. Your shoes look fine. They just look fine. And, and it's, how many of you understand what I'm talking about? They, they ask these questions. So it's diplomacy. So notice what's going on now. They should be excited. Everybody said they should be excited. Now notice why. Why should they be excited? They should be excited because, listen, they got to have a part to play in walking in the plan of God, even though they got in on the back door. God is delivering their nation. They should be excited. They should be rejoicing. What do they do? Oh, let's read it. This is people to the letter of the T. Verse 1. And the men of Ephraim said unto him. Now they're getting that face to face. Got two heads up here showing them. Hey, look, we got these two princes here. This Oreb and him. Here they are right here. Look, we got them. We got them. Oh, by the way, let's read on. And they said unto him. In other words, they're saying to Gideon. Why hast thou served, why hast thou served us thus that thou callest us not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? In other words, why did you shortchange us and not call on us to help you to get into the fight? Now, instead of them rejoicing that they're driving out the enemy, they're complaining. And actually, listen, they're offended at Gideon for not asking them. But I want to remind you, I told you to write down the road of victory is not always going to be easy. Did God tell Gideon to ask them? If you don't know the answer, go back. He did not. As a matter of fact, even if they did show up, he still would have got it down to 300 people. And so Gideon followed God. Sometimes when you follow God and do what God says do, people may get offended. I don't understand why. Why couldn't we be a part of this? But remember, they are a part of it now, and they're having some success in taking out some of the leadership, right? They should be rejoicing, right? The Bible talks about rejoicing with those who are rejoicing. But they're not. They're complaining. And notice what they said in the very last part of verse 1. And they did chide with him. And notice it says sharply. In other words, they were being very loud, very belligerent, and very mad and very upset at him. Because you didn't call us to help you with this fight. Now, I don't know about you. And I don't want to put words in Gideon's mouth. But I just know how my flesh is. And there's been a few times in my life people have said that to me. And, and I don't say what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. But here's what I'm thinking that Gideon is saying. Or what he wants to tell him. But he doesn't tell him this. Because he's now dealing with people and now dealing with diplomacy. And listen, Gideon's mission here is not to get at odds with the people. Gideon's mission is to drive out the Midianites. And to gain victory that God told them that he's supposed to take. Can't get distracted, church. The enemy likes to get distractions. He'll get you off course just a little bit. You say, well, what's the big deal if I'm off course a little bit? Well, if you go off course a long, long way, you keep getting further and further away from the plan and the purpose of God. Stay with it. I think this is what Gideon would like to have said, but he didn't. Well, if you guys are so tough and so mean and so bad, why did you... Need God to raise me up and take the enemy? Why don't you just take it? Better off, why didn't you just start the war? But Gideon didn't say that. 
But how many know that's how your flesh talks? That's how your mind talks. Well, if you're so rough and tough, why didn't you just go ahead and take the Midianites without me? Anybody ever feel like that? Well, if you're so tough, why didn't you just do it yourself? But he didn't do that. That's not how you practice diplomacy. And so he's very, very upset with him, very arrogant, very smart with him. And he said unto them, what have, I, what have I done in comparison to you? In other words, hey, listen, guys, up to this point, and you go back and study it, up to this point, you ready for this church? Up to this point, the 300 men and Gideon haven't killed anybody. They haven't slew one person yet, not one. God has. God come down. Come on, church. And these guys went out in pursuit, and they caught two princes, two high-ranking officials from the enemy's camp. And so what does he do? Write this scripture down, Proverbs 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away what, church? Turns away wrath. What does he do? He doesn't get excited. Doesn't get excited. As a matter of fact, if you read Proverbs, it tells you over and over and over again, how do I turn anger away? It talks over and over and over again about, number one, don't get excited and don't get loud. How do we turn down somebody that's angry and bitter and resentful? we got to turn it down. I just can't respond and get wild-eyed and crazy. Eye for an eye ain't going to work. Because what, what, if, you know, if you get married and you practice that and you figure that out, it don't take long. If he gets mad and I get mad, he gets loud and I get mad, what do you do? You just keep throwing fuel on each other's fires. Right? And then God comes along and says a soft answer. Everybody say a soft answer. Look to your neighbor and go, chill out, calm down, and give a soft, easy answer. Come on, everybody say, chill out, calm down, and a soft, easy answer. Now, Ecclesiastes says that a calm spirit turns away the wrath of a king. What does that mean? Just because the king's mad. And the king's upset, and the king's wild-eyed, and he's ranting and raving, and he's throwing his arms around, getting mad and excited. Don't you be excited. How can I get the king to calm down? Back in those days, if you got the king riled, and you thought, oh, I'll just tell the king what I think. Listen, the next words out of that king are off with your head. So if you don't want that to happen, what do you got to do? You better go the way of God and just stay calm. Everybody say, stay calm and speak softly. <laughs> so what does he do? He said in verse 6, and he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison to you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiel? Now, now Ephraim is one of their tribes, and apparently they had grapes growing everywhere. And he said, man, listen. He said, have you looked at your tribe and the vegetation? He said, man, that's way better, more beautiful looking than where I'm living at. And not only that, hey, you guys have got, you killed two princes. We haven't killed anybody yet. We're still in pursuit. I mean, man, you guys are awesome. You guys have done more than we've done. Way to go. What's he doing? He's practicing diplomacy, calming people down. Verse 3. He said, God hath delivered into your hands the prince of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison? Well, up to this point, he hadn't even killed anybody. Not anybody. They're still in pursuit. And he said, what have I done in comparison to what you guys have done? Notice what happens in verse 3, the last part. Then their anger was abated toward him. In other words, they turned away. They calmed down. Everybody said, they calmed down toward him when he had said that. Verse 4, and Gideon came to Jordan, passed over. He and the 300 men that were with him faint. Everybody say, they were tired and they were hungry, and yet they were still going after the enemy. Verse 5, and he said unto the men of Sukkoth, give, I pray thee. Now, Sukkoth is a, is a town or a village or a city, and it's within the 12 tribes, the nation of Israel, and so it's in the nationality of Israel. It's a town in there, different tribe, different place, different location. 
And so he's doing this for all the nation of Israel. God is through him. All the enemies driving all the, the Midianites out. And so when this happens, everybody benefits from it. And so he goes to one of the towns. They're tired, Jeannie. They've been pursuing. They're fighting. How many know fighting takes a lot of energy, a lot of exertion? At some point, you have to rehydrate yourself, rest a little bit, and you've got to get some food in you. So they come to one of the towns, one of the cities of their people, and notice what happens to them. And it's, he said unto the men of Sukkoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto my people that follow me. In other words, hey, guys, I need some bread. Give me some bread. Bring some bread out here. Bring some food out here from my men. We're in hot pursuit. We're driving the, hot, hot pursuit. We're driving the men out of the Midianites out, and we need some food to get refreshed, to get stirred back up again. We're getting tired. That's what the word faint means. And he said, Unto the people that follow me, for they, are, they be faint, and I am pursuing Zabin and Z- Zemula, the kings. Now, here's the kings of Midia. And the princes or the leadership of Zukoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zamina now in thine hands that we should give bread unto thine army? In other words, what they're saying is, do you have hands from these guys to prove that you killed them? Because if you don't have hands to prove that they're dead, I'm not giving you any food. Now listen, listen, church. This is, this is other Israelites. These are people from their own group. They should have said, absolutely, man, whatever we got, here it is. Take it. Eat it. You're taking down the enemy. Let's do it. Now, he gets very offensive at this. They should have been helping Everybody say this with me. No help, no reward. Say it again. No help, no reward. Matthew chapter 25, write it down. Jesus and his teaching. He's teaching one of his lessons. And he's rebuking people and giving people credit depending upon if they helped or if they didn't help. And he said, I wasn't hungry and you fed me not. Now, remember, Gideon is a man, but he's under divine orders from God. He's doing the will of God on earth for the whole nation to benefit from. So, in the Hebrews, you go back and study this out, the Hebrews thought if you intervened or if you didn't hook up with a person who was operating under the divine will of God, then it was treason. Because, listen, because you went against the will of God. Pretty serious, isn't it? (laughs) Goes hand in hand with what we watched for 12 minutes, doesn't it? And so what's going on? Notice it said to them. Actually, write the scripture reference down, Matthew 25, verses 33 to verse 46. And he said, I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. Some, he was hungry, and he fed him. And then he said this. He said, as much as you have done it unto the least of them, you have done it unto me. In other words, it wasn't me specifically, but it was me because they were doing what I told them to do, and because you didn't do what they asked you to do, did it under me. Association. It's quiet, doesn't it? When we think, oh, I, be- I better get my hand to the plow and do something. I, I better get my hand to the plow and-, and-, and do what God's been telling me to do. I better get involved. Better get involved. Everybody say, better get involved. Because if I don't give any help, I don't get any reward. No help, no reward. And so verse 5, he said, and he said unto the men of Sukkoth, give up, pray the loaves of bread. They didn't. They asked for, hey, do you got the hands of the guys? Otherwise, we're not going to do it. 
Verse 7, And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Deba and Zaloth unto mine hand. In other words, he goes, Guys, I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm going to go get these two kings, and when I get them, I'm coming back. And I'm coming back for you. And he said, And I will tear your flesh with the thorns of wilderness, thorns of the wilderness, and with briars. Now, I don't know about you, but I get this picture, briars and thorns. He's going to take branches of these briars and thorns, and he said, when I get these two kings, I'm coming back. Remember, in their thinking, he's on a divine mission from God, and you claim to be the people of God, and you said we're not going to help you. You have taken opposition against God. And when I come back, I'm going to take thorn bushes, branches, and briars, and I am going to beat you with them. Now, you just take a look at some of the thorn bushes and the briars that we've got in this area, this location. Some of them have nasty barbs on them. And he said, when I come back, I'm going to get these kings, and when I do, I'm coming back for you. And so he spake to the men again. He said, when I come again, in verse 9, when I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Now, this tower means that this, this city or this town, uh, of course, he, from verse 8, he went to the second city, and he went to the second city and says, and we came up to Penuel, and he asked them the same, and they said, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to help you. And so they were a fortified city. One was a fortified city, and one was not a fortified city. But he told them, when I come back, guys, you're going to be in trouble because you didn't help. Everybody say this with me. No help, no reward. Verse 10. Now when Zeba and Zebuna were in Kokar and their host with them, about 15,000 men, so that's what the 15,000 men were left out of the 135,000, and their host with them, about 15,000 men, all that were left of the host of the children of the east. For there fell 120,000 men with that, with, that drew swords. And Gideon went up by the way of them and dwelt in tents on the east of Naba. And it says, and smote the host, for the host was secure. Now, that's a little blind in the King James, but what that, meant, what that really means, if you go and look it up, what it means was that Gideon, with his 300 men and himself, 301 men, he came to the 15,000 men who thought they were secure, they were safe from Gideon. He sneak attacked them, gave them a surprise attack, and he slew all of them. Now, if you look that up, 15,000 men, soldiers, against 300 is a 50 to 1 odds. I'll submit this to you. We like to think of odds. Oh, well, you know, you go to the doctor, the doctor says, well, you got a 50% chance. 50% chance, man, that's not very good. Well, 50 to 1. That means that there were 50 bad soldiers to one good soldier. That means that every man had to average 50 kills. Overwhelming odds, except for one thing. If God be with you, all things are possible to him that what? These 300 men were believers. They were hooked up. They were in a divine plan. They said, we can do this. They took down 51 odds. I tell you, if you've got gods on your side, even if the enemy says you have no chance, God says, Take it. I'm with you. You're not going to lose. I didn't raise you. I didn't teach you. I didn't inspire you. I didn't gift you. I didn't call you to fail. I called you to win. And when you win, you're going to tell somebody else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good, church. Now, if you go back and read the rest of the story, you have to go back. He catches the two kings. He takes the two kings. 
He has them. And what does he do? He keeps his word. He's a man of his word. He went back to both cities. One city, the first city, he said, who wasn't a fortified city, he said, I'm coming back and I'm going to whip you with thorns and briars. He went back to that city. Go back, just read the next four or five verses. You'll find it. He went back to that city, pulled out all the elders. What are the elders? The elders were not spiritual people. These were leaders, councilmen, people of the church, the government of the church. Pulled them out and he whipped every one of them with briars and thorns. Taught him a lesson. But then he went to Penuel. Penuel was a fortified city. He had a high tower. He said, when I come back, I'm going to destroy your tower. Why? Because it was a fortified city, and it was a fortified tower. I don't know personally. I read several commentaries on this. I don't know personally if he actually slew all the leaders of that town or if they barricaded themselves in that high tower thinking they were safe. From Gideon, and they just, because he said he was going to knock the tower down. Oh, I don't know if when him knocking the tower down killed all of them, but nevertheless, he said, I'm going to get every one of you, and he did. In the mind of the Hebrew people, when you stand in the way of a divine ordinance of God, in their mind, it is treason. We think, why was it so fierce and so, in their mind, they chose and opposed God. I don't even know if you oppose God, there goes your protection. Huh? Do you get the benefits and the blessings if you're opposing God? No, no. Listen, if you're opposing God, you're on the other side. Even if you're a Christian, if you're opposing God and the Word of God, which is the truth, and God can't lie, then when you choose to go oppose against it, then how many know you don't get God's reward? If anything, you're going to get the enemy's reward. So what does he do? Now, go back, if you would, please, real quickly. Go to verse 18, real quickly. Now, he's got these two kings. He's got these two kings. We're going to wrap it up. He's got two kings. We don't have tonight's service. You can stay for a couple more minutes. It'll be all right. God's good. We need to learn these things because God's raising up men just like Gideon, raising up women just like Gideon. Come out of nowhere. Nobody. Don't have a name. Don't have a title. You know, might not have a long degree of great education or great wealth, but they have a heart after God. So he has these two kings, and, and I don't know why. I don't know why he did, but Gideon, he's going to kill both of them. And he tells them, I'm going to kill both of you. But before he kills them and tells them that, they give him a compliment. Now, remember, I told you that he told God, God, you can't choose me because my family is poor. Remember that. Because when he's talking to these two kings, we find a history. Gideon knows who these two kings are because these two kings killed his family. And he said, do you remember when you were at this such and such a place in this family? And the king said, yeah, we remember. And he killed everybody there. He said, yeah, when you did that, you killed my family. And apparently, the reason for killing them was not justified. It was murder. The difference between war and murder. How many of you know that? Difference. And so... He begins to tell them, because you didn't spare their life, I'm not going to spare your life. And so, in verse 18, Then sent he to Ziblah and Zeph, he said, What manner of men were they whom they slew at Tabar? In other words, what manner of men? What do you think about them? What, do you th- what, what, what did you think about those people that you had slew there? And he said, and they answered and said, And they answered, As thou art. In other words, well, they were just like you. Everybody say, just like you, Gideon. Now, now think about this for just a second. I want you to just think about this. Stay with me now. Don't think about the time. I want you to just meditate on these things today. Think about this for a second now. Gideon's mind, and Gideon's mind, thought process, and how he looked at himself was, I'm just a poor country boy. I don't have two nickels to rub together. My, not I'm I poor, but my whole family's poor. But these kings... 
When they looked at Gideon, John, that's not what they seen. They didn't see somebody poor genie. They saw somebody that was a king's kid. Now, where's the parallel to that? Well, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, write it down. What's going on? Apostles are out preaching the Word of God, and the religious scoffers, they recognize something. They said, they're uneducated. They're not, we know that they haven't been educated the way we have. In other words, they don't have the education level that we have. But listen, and he said, but we know they have been with Jesus. In other words, <laughs> cut through everything else, we know one thing. They've been with Jesus because they're acting just like he would if he was here. What's going on, church? Transformation. There's a transformation that goes to every child of God when we fellowship and when we walk close to God. What happens? You ready for this? Us begins to leave, and he begins to rub off on us. Come on, church. To the place where they no longer see us, Rub it off. Now let's read it. I want you to see it for yourself. The transformation. This is what happens. And he said, as thou art. In other words, why we saw people just, just look like you. So they were. Each one resembled the children of a king. In other words, why? They just look like you. I mean, apparently when they looked at Gideon, they didn't see Gideon as just some poor family. When they saw Gideon, they saw somebody like, well, you're just, uh, I mean, you're just, just like you, like you're, you're a king. You're from a kingly, a royal family. Now, how many know, church, this is a compliment? A and this is actually, <clears throat> believe it or not, this is, what, this is what God and Jesus and the Holy Ghost want for every believer, that when people look at us, they don't see us, but they see them. And so that's a compliment. Verse 19. And he said, They were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if ye, sh if ye, had, if ye had saved them alive, in other words, if you wouldn't have murdered them, I would not slay you. And he said unto Jether, his firstborn. In other words, his youngest, his, first, his, his firstborn. And, and I don't know why he asked them this. I have no idea. Maybe he thought it was going to be honor. I have no clue. But he asked his firstborn, he said, up and slay them. In other words, son, I'm giving you, because you're with me here, I'm giving you the opportunity to take these two kings. I don't know if Gideon, I read all kinds of commentaries, and, and you know, a lot of them said it, and I don't know if Gideon said, I'm going to give you the privilege and the honor of killing them, because listen, whoever kills them, they're going to talk about you for a long time. They're going to say, yeah, but Gideon's son, he's the one that killed the two kings, and that's how they were going to talk about it. And it was going to go down that way. I, I don't know if that's the reason or not. But listen to the two kings, the enemy. He said, but the youth drew not his sword, for he feared. In other words, he, he just wouldn't do it because he, was, because he was yet a youth. And then the two kings, Zeba and Zoma, said, Rise thou. Now they're still very brassy. They're still arrogant. They're still cocky. And they make nasty comments to him. And they said, Rise thou and fall upon us. In other words, why don't you rise up and why don't you be the one to call us? Or modern day terminology, why don't you be a man and do it yourself? Now, if you think there's any hesitation in getting and doing this, you are wrong. Because look at his reaction. None whatsoever. And Gideon arose and slew them and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's neck. In other words, he was taking the spoils. So, I mean, the minute they said, why don't you, if you're really a man, why don't you just stand up and do it? And how many of you know Gideon stood up and did it in a heartbeat? And guess what? He got the spoils. Everybody say, we get the spoils. Come on, say it again. We get the spoils. Now, I don't know if you remember this or not, but there's a part in there. And the prophecy, go back and look it up. 
The Bible says wealth and riches shall be in my house and the wealth of the sinner. You've heard me preaching, giving offerings. The wealth of the sinner has been laid up for who? Who's the just? Everybody, raise your hands up and say, I'm the just. The spoils are coming my way. I'm the just. The riches and the wealth are coming my way. Not by my ability, not by my intelligence, not by my hard work, but by the Spirit of the living God, my God, who I serve. Thank you, Father, for the victory, for the victories. Thank you, Father. You love us so much. Thank you, Father. You're raising us up to be strong in you and in the power of your might. Thank you, Father. I am not trying to be, not going to be someday, but I am, because of you, the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. I am everything that you say that I am. I can do everything that you say I can do. Thank you, Father, for coming into my life. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for delivering me from the powers of darkness. Set me into your kingdom, and I give you all the praise all the glory, and your kingdom is filled with power and might and strength. And I give you all the praise. I give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. How many of you are getting ready to be risen up by God? Thank you, Lord. There's a stirring in the land. Glory to God. Don't be moved. Don't be moved by what you see on the outside. How many of you know... There's a reason why they're on the outside. We're on the inside. We're in the body of Christ. Everybody say, I'm in the body of Christ. I have a divine track, a divine path, a hotline to God. I talk to Him, and He talks to me. Stand up, if you would, please.